Hi everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us for this very special live conversation on Canada's whales. My name is Wei Wei Su and I'm with the communications team here at WWF Canada. For the next 45 minutes we will be diving into this iconic marine species with our splashy scientists. You might remember that World Oceans Day was on June 8th and that gave us an excuse here at WWF to celebrate and flip over whales all month. Um, today we'll be talking about the great diversity of whales that we have here in Canada from the north coast of BC to the St. Lawrence River and uh, Sable Gully off the coast of Nova Scotia. And uh, we will be talking about the fragile recovery um, of whales from centuries of commercial whaling and uh, their comeback from being nearly wiped out. And we'll talk about what WWF and our partners are doing to make sure Canada's whales thrive in healthy waters. And I promise that you will learn at least one new thing about whales tonight. And if we do our jobs right, that will be more like 20 things. Um, I want to mention that in order for WWF to keep doing our whales and oceans work, it is critical that we have funds to support it. Um, you can help in many ways from simply adopting an orca from our e-store or making a larger contribution and you can find great ocean stories and ways to give on our website and here I'll just make a quick shameless plug it's www.wwf.ca and uh, more on this later now what I have in front of me is a list of very tough and serious questions for our scientists um, but uh, I just want to mention that uh, you, the audience, can answer or ask questions as well. You can do this in two ways. Um, open the Q&A box in your Google Hangout page under the video and type your questions there. Or you can email us at any time at live at www.canada.org. This is your chance to ask. You know, I know whales don't like heavy metal marine pollution, but would they rock out to heavy metal music? Um, you know, and, and, and other tough questions like that. So let me introduce you to our panel of scientists. Um, first is Dr. Hal Whitehead. He is a professor in the Department of Biology at Dalhousie University, and he's one of the world's foremost experts on the social behavior and culture of whales. He studies uh, sperm and northern bottlenose whales, on a 12-meter sailboat and just recently came back from sea. Um, so Hal, you started studying northern bottlenose whales in the late 80s. Did your hair look this fabulous back in the 80s? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I think it was, it was redder and it was okay. bigger. Um, I, I can't remember. imagine it being bigger. And it was um, longer. <laughs> it was longer, okay. Um, but what, what made you get into this area of research in the first place? I loved sailing, and um, whales are a good excuse to go sailing in the deep ocean, uh, which is what I like to do. And then I found they were oh, quite fascinating to do. So uh, it's a great combination. Well, thank you for, for having us. It's a special treat uh, that you can join us. Um, now let's go to Tanya Wimmer. She is a marine mammal biologist and has spent the past seven years with WWF Canada. Um, she's been focusing on reducing entanglements of endangered North Atlantic right whales and bycatch of at-risk sharks and sea turtles. She was a student of HALS at Dalhousie University and has spent over 52 weeks at sea studying whales and dolphins. So Tanya, be honest, was Hal a good teacher? <laughs> uh, when it came to uh, fixing engines and learning how to fix things on a boat, you betcha. Uh, I'm just kidding. It's, uh, no, absolutely fabulous experiences. Most of my time at sea actually has been with Hal or on his boat and it has always been uh, quite, a, quite a treasure. Yeah, and can you just quickly tell us the story? Um, I heard that you were once on an expedition off the coast of Chile, and a blue whale sneezed on you. Yeah, kind of. It was the. Uh, it was actually on Hal's boat. We were doing some research down there on uh, sperm whales, and uh, it was the first time I'd ever actually seen a blue whale. And and uh, these are absolutely massive animals, and about two to three times the size of this the the boat that we were on. And all I could remember is this whale popped up next to us, and there was this huge blow. 
And afterwards, everyone was just sort of shaking and going, oh my god, that was the snot of the largest animal on the planet. <laughs> it, was, it was something to behold with everyone on the boat sort of just celebrating this very bizarre thought. Wow, and then you needed like 50 Kleenexes yeah, just to yeah. get it off. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, so next let, uh, let me introduce you to Robert Michaud, um, co-founder and director of um, the Group of Research and Education on Marine Mammals. Grem, for short. Um, Grem is a nonprofit organization focused on scientific research of whales of the St. Lawrence and marine conservation. Uh, Robert oversees a number of projects on belugas of the St. Lawrence estuary. So, Robert, you were also a student of HALS. Uh, is it a requirement for male marine biologists to have like luscious curly hair in order to properly <laughs> conduct research? <laughs> Before I spent a winter or two at Hal's lab, I had very short hair. Yeah. Hal has been very inspiring. It's also in my hair. Appearance. Yeah. Thanks, Hal, for that. <laughs> <laughs> and Robert, what do you think is the most interesting thing about belugas? Why do you why do you love belugas? Um, the fact that we don't know much about these animals, and as as much as we find about these animals, uh, we find that no, oh, wow, they live in a pretty complex society. And uh, I can't wait to bring my beluga knowledge to the big table to compare how beluga lives with elephant, with sperm whales, with bottlenose dolphins. So bringing a new species on the table and compare. We like scientists to compare things. And I hope I'll bring beluga on the table pretty soon, <laughs> at least their way of life, their society. Learning how to outlive an, a new animal that we don't know much about is, is fascinating. It's a privilege, I would say. Okay, wonderful. And uh, finally, we have Janie Ray. Um, she is the director of Cetacea Lab, a hydrophone research station on Gill Island in BC's Great Bear region. The station is dedicated to the study of acoustic, feeding, and social behavior of orca, humpback, and fin whales. We're really to have. Uh, we're really lucky to have her with us because she's in a very, very remote area, and the internet connection there is is pretty spotty. So we may lose her on video at times. So she'll just be on audio. Um, we may have a slight delay um, from. Uh, when I ask her question and, and when she answers. So if that happens, just, just bear with us. And um, my question for Janie is you and your research partner, Herman, um, are citizen scientists and you moved out there in 1996 to set up this research station. Um, it, you know, it must be amazing for you to wake up and go to sleep every day with the whales right outside your window. And you were saying that, you know, one could pass you, um, you know, during this Google Hangout. So. What inspired you to, to make this huge life change and, and move out there? Oh, you know, I th think one of the main reasons we wanted to come to such a remote area is that we wanted to study and listen to whales in an area where there was very little underwater noise. So this location is perfect for that because there's mainly a lot of whales and not a lot of boats or people. So it's it's a great place to to observe them in their natural habitat. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you all for joining us. And um, and before we get to my my very serious questions, I'd like to start things off with a mean game of trivia. These questions um, all came from our WWF uh, Facebook page and all of our whale lovers and whale fanatics there. So thanks to uh, all of you who submitted questions. And, um, and experts, if, if any one of you gets the answers wrong, the others should feel free to heckle them. Okay? So, you know, bring it on. It's, uh, it's yeah, don't hold back. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll put the first question to Tanya. This question came from Laura. She wants to know, is it true that a blue whale's tongue is the size of an African elephant? Ah. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, interesting. I don't think I've ever actually seen a blue whale's tongue up close like that. Um, <laughs> I would anticipate it's exceptionally large. I do know um, because they're a baleen whale, they get to sort of expand their throat when they eat. And I have heard that you could stick several elephants in their whole mouth. So like three or four elephants would actually fit in their mouth when they actually open it up wide to take a gulp of food. So I imagine a tongue probably could be about the size of one elephant. Okay. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And others, do, do you go? Do you guys agree? Yeah, I, I heard the heart of a beluga was the size of a beetle, 
a Volkswagen Beetle, but I've never compared oh, yeah. the, the size of the, the tongue. But I would agree with Tonya. It's it should be huge and very powerful to to push all that water through the the, the baleen. Uh, it's pretty big and very strong. Yeah. Well, it's good that you guys know if, if she answered correctly or not, because I have no idea. Like, all these books behind me, I've not read any of them. <laughs> um, okay, Hal, this question's for you. This comes from Karen. Um, she asks, which whale species dive the deepest? Oh, that's cheating. Uh, well, it, it, it's yeah. harder than it seems, Tonya. <laughs> <laughs> At the moment, um, we thought it was the northern bottomless whale the, where we study. Yep. Until a few months ago, some scientists put some devices on another strange creature called Cuvier's beaked whale, and um, they went down deeper. <laughs> so um, I, I, I can't remember how far they went. Maybe maybe um, one of the others do, but I think it was two thousand meters or so. Wow, mm -hmm. amazing. Okay, so that's that's fantastic, and we're we're learning new stuff uh, every day. Um, so this one, this question's for Janie. Um, comes from Adria. How many teeth do orcas have? Oh my gosh, <laughs> I don't know exactly how many they have. <laughs> Anyone want to help her out? Uh, take a guess. Whatever you guess, I'm gonna probably think it's right. So <laughs> I've never done that. Like like inside her mouth. Hmm. Hal, do you have, no, uh, no, have a guess? I'm not going there now. I'll no, see. okay. Well, <laughs> we'll just leave it blank. Um, and uh, next question for Robert. Audrey asked, how many different types of whales exist in the world? We're close to, uh, if you include dolphins and porpoises, we're close to 80. So, and it's, so after all, it's a pretty small group of animal compared to birds or insects, for example. Mm -hmm. But it's amazing within that approximately 80 species, there is a huge diversity. If you compare a blue whale with a harbor porpoise, for example, you have a huge animal and a very small one. And they also range in huge diversity of social system and ranging. Some live in the freshwater, some in the deep ocean, some in the estuarine river. So despite it's a very small group of animal, it's immensely diverse. diverse. Okay. Good answer, good answer. Um, and uh, next, Tanya, Danielle asked, do, males, uh, do whales mate for life? Oh, interesting question, actually. Um, for the most part, as far as I know, none of them do. So unlike other, some other mammals, some birds, uh, whales, for the most part, uh, don't form long-term bonds like that between males and females. OK. Uh, next, uh, this question's for Hal. Uh, Lauren asks, how do you tell the difference between a male and female whale? Huh. <laughs> well, for mo there are a few species where um, there's something pretty obvious. So okay. the orcas <laughs> have these huge great fins on the males, so that, that's easy. Even, even I can figure that one out. And okay. the northern bottlenose whales that we study, the males have this extraordinary flat white head. It's like uh, someone squashed their head and painted it white. So that that's pretty easy, but for many of them, they you know like for the humpbacks that Jamie studies, it's not obvious when you look at them. So you have to get down and have their naughty bits, which is quite hard because they're underwater. <laughs> I love how that you said naughty bits. <laughs> that's great. Okay, and uh, this question is <laughs> next question is for Jamie. Um, comes from Elizabeth. How much food do whales eat in a day? Oh. Okay, well, I guess it depends on what kind of whale. Oh. We may have uh, may have lost it. Eats fish. Oh. oh, you. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Oh. Yep, we're okay. Uh, Janie, if you don't mind, I'll just uh, finish this last question. Uh, for Robert, and then we'll move on to our, our next section. Um, and Robert, last question okay. from Nancy. Can a, can a whale eat a shark? Wow, can a whale eat a shark? I don't think so. I've never heard about uh, The only one that could do that is probably the killer whale that could yeah. attack a shark. But I've heard about dolphin uh, pushing shark away from their groups 
Um, so, but I don't think it's a, it would be a regular praise pieces. Right. Fuse pieces would be equipped to do so, and probably none do on a regular basis. Okay. All right. I well, I think you all did. Can I disagree with oh, Robert? Of course. Of course. Well, I think there are two kinds of whales. Uh, two kinds of whales to regularly eat sharks. There's a shark eating type of killer whales off, off um, Vancouver Island. Yeah, all the shores. They, it seems, mainly eat sharks. Mm -hmm. And in some parts of the North Atlantic, there are male sperm whales who seem to spend much of their time eating sharks. So you're right that most whales really give the sharks a bit of a wide berth, but there's a, there's a few who like them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, th thanks for correcting me on yeah, that. And, and it's <laughs> fascinating that, that, that those offshore killer whales have been discovered very recently, only about 10 years ago. So it's pretty new stuff and exciting. I, I just forgot that. Sorry, Hal. <laughs> <laughs> Cover your tracks. Cover your tracks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, well, that, that, thank you, thank you, guys. That that was great. Uh, you all did fairly poorly, so uh, you know, <laughs> maybe go home and study some more. Except for Hal. Um, okay. Well, Tanya, I want to ask uh, ask you this next question, um, and it is to get sort of a, a big picture on what's happening. So. Whales are facing a fragile recovery, as we know, from centuries of, of commercial whaling here in Canada. The good news is that many of them are making a comeback. And since 2004, we saw the number of humpbacks around BC's uh, Gill Island, where Janie is, jump from 42 to 300, which is fantastic news. The bad news is that whales are still facing many risks. Uh, in Canadian waters. So Tanya, I'd like you to just give us the big picture of the serious risk, uh, risks that Canada's whales are facing now and why you know people like you guys aren't exactly packing up your bags and calling it a day. You know, instead of um, commercial whaling, the threats now seem to be uh, things like fishing and impacts from shipping and noise and, and those types of things. For sure. Thanks, uh, Weiwei. So yeah, as you hinted, I mean the sort of the biggest impact, uh, or we've had sort of like a centuries of impact on uh, whale populations globally, um, you know, and some of it, some of it good, I mean a lot of it is a very cultural, very spiritual aspects, but a lot of it has actually been uh, from a much more negative perspective, and so a lot of those populations globally have been sort of de very much uh, depleted, and some pretty much almost wiped out by whaling, uh, and you know, some of them, like you said, are recovering, but we're actually now seeing them sort of hit a new phase of different kinds of human uh, impacts. And Canada is no different, as you said. So um, you're going to hear a bit more from from some of the other uh, people here about some of the, the different species across Canada. Um, but on the big picture, there's you know we have quite a few different whale populations and whales, dolphins, and, and porpoises and whatnot, all in all three of Canada's oceans. Um, and in every place, there are different obstacles and different hurdles that they all have to get over. And uh, you know, whaling really isn't the the thing anymore. Right. Um, and now it's much more, like you said, it's things like uh, impacts potentially from boats going through areas where they're known to be. Um, you know, we have an awful lot of fishing that happens in uh, in our coastal waters where these animals also like to come to feed or to to have babies and things like that. Um, you know, there are aspects from things like chemical pollutants. You'll hear more about that. Um, in all of the oceans, and of course, there's issues around things like noise. Um, you know, uh, these animals are ones that use the sound and the environment to do pretty much everything, and and so the oceans getting noisier from all those activities plus many more is creating quite a bit of a, a hurdle for them. Mm -hmm. So it's one of these things that um, you know, the good news is that there's lots of people who are out there trying to understand these animals, trying to manage these industries, trying to figure out ways that they can coexist. Um, but we really do have um, you know, a lot of challenges and a lot of, a little bit of, you know, uphill battle and a lot of things to still work out and still to figure out how to do. That's right. And can you just give um, a, a brief uh, uh, overview of what WWF is, is doing to address, you know, some of these issues? For sure. So, I mean, we've actually been working um, and we continue to work with many partners uh, across the country um, from, uh, to deal with sort of a wide range of these threats uh, to all these whales and these relatives. Um, our work really has focused uh, on many different levels. Uh, anything from bringing the attention, bringing these issues to the attention of key decision makers at both national and sort of uh, local governments. Uh, we've also funded a wide range of the research that has happened in this country for the last few decades. Uh, WWF actually funded quite a bit of it. Uh, we also continue to work with partners to see some of that key research done, 
whether it's on things like impacts from sound or uh, risk from entanglements to things like right whales. Um, one of the key roles I also see that we play too is that we very much uh, try to be as collaborative in nature as possible and we work very much to bring people together. Um, and what we always aim and strive to do too is very much to bring them, bring everyone together to the table. You know, no one is left out because a solution is never going to come from one group. It's never going to come out of the head of one person. It's very much coming from everyone being around a table and looking at this issue from all aspects. So whether it's academics, uh, government people, we have NGO participants, and we also very much ha involve industry, whether it's the shipping mm -hmm. industry, whether it's the fishing industry. You know, so it's very much about bringing everyone together to see what we can do. Um, to try to make the situation better. That's great. Um, yeah. Yeah, and and we will hear um, in a little bit from Hal, and I, I'll be asking him about the uh, the Gully MPA. Uh, but uh, but first, I want to sneak in this this question from our audience, and we have a question from Nate, who's five years old. And uh, I'll open this up to anyone who who wants to take a stab at it. How do whales jump high out of the water, and why do they do this? Oh, I think Hal wrote a paper on this one. Oh, well, how you better take it then. <laughs> oh, oh <laughs> Well, I did write a paper, but the conclusion of the paper is we don't really know. Um, <laughs> Great. <laughs> uh, and um, one of the things that strikes me about whales when I'm out there is how little I know. So a few weeks ago, I was surrounded by sperm whales. And I've been studying them for over 30 years now. And I thought, I have no idea what these guys are doing. And I looked at the other creatures there. There was a shark. There was an albatross. There was some other birds and things. And I thought, I think I know what that shark's doing. I think I know what that bird's doing. So there's a huge mystery with these animals. And part of that is, why do they leave the environment where they you know, where, where, where they're happy, where they make their living, where they do all their important stuff, and jump into our habitat up into the air. Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you, there are various theories. They're trying to get rid of nasty bits of skin, or mm. they're uh, just jumping for joy. Um, but I, I think a lot of it is a signal to the other whales. And the, the whales are, are leaping. Uh, when they're trying to make a point, come on guys, let's move on. Hey, yeah. I, I really do not like this boat near me, or whatever it is. And so just as when we want to make a point, we jump up and down and stamp up feet and wave our arms, they leap out of the water. That's my theory, it's probably wrong like most of my other theories, but <laughs> there you go. Well, I'm sure Nate uh, appreciates this. <laughs> very, uh, very good answer from you. So, so thank you, Hal. And uh, just a reminder that uh, people can send us questions. They can email us at live at wwfcanada.org or type it in the uh, Q and A box. Um, so, I want to move on to the West Coast and and uh, where Jamie is, and ask her this question. Um, so, where you are based on Gill Island are some of BC's quietest and nutrient rich waters. And it's a great spot, like you said, for listening and, and recording whales because it is so quiet. Um, there's uh, one humpback there who is very special. His name is Yoda. Can you talk about Yoda and this area that uh, he and, and you are um, called the Great Bear Region? Absolutely. I just want to check. You can hear me okay right now? Yep, I can hear you. Okay, great. Yeah, Yoda is a, such a great example of how humpbacks do have companions. And Yoda, he's just so charismatic. Whenever he comes into the area, yeah, I mean, talking about breaching, it's one of the first things we see is he's breaching, he's tail slapping. He just seems to get all the other whales active, and he's always going from group to group, and he just seems to get everybody into this mode of singing and vocalizing and so he's, yeah, he's a real character, and he's just so easy to identify. He's got a huge white fluke with a big dark circle, so everybody just caught on to his name very, very quickly. We keep getting reports over the VHF radio, hey, I saw Yoda today. So he's, he's a pretty interesting whale. Um, 
and and there's a great uh, web uh, there's a great blog series that you wrote for us that's on our website right now and uh, if if you guys want to read more about Yoda you can find it at wwf.ca and Janie I just want to ask you a follow-up question which is you know of course we were all uh, very alarmed uh, over the recent federal government's decision to approve the Enbridge Northern Gateway pipeline proposal uh, which will bring massive oil tankers through this area and WWF and Coastal First Nations have worked to bring awareness to this issue and to rally Canadians to raise their voice how do you think, um, how will the oil tankers impact the whales um, if, if it does happen? Well, to be really honest with you, I don't think that those oil tankers will be going through here. Our, our feeling within this community and throughout all of BC is that um, it's still not a done deal. The shovel hasn't hit the ground, so we'd be very surprised if an oil tanker ever made its way through here. And uh, just last weekend, the First Nations village of Hartley Bay, um, all the women within the village actually crocheted a chain, and it was just made of wool. And they took this chain and they took it from one end of Douglas Channel all the way into the First Nations village of Hartley Bay, and it just showed so much hope and courage that uh, we won't. The oil tankers, but in regards to tankers, if any sort of tanker was to come through here, um, we would see whales being hit by ships. There's no doubt. There's days you can sit out there in Squally Channel, which is right on the side of the lab here, and there's blows from one end to the other. There's humpback whales. There's fin whales. They're coming here to feed, to socialize. They're bringing their calves here, and it would be it would be a tragedy if any of those tankers were to go through such pristine whale habitat. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Janie. And um, uh, I, I do want to bring in another question from the audience. Um, Amy wants to know, what whales would I be able to see in Nova Scotia in July? Um, Tanya, do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, I would say, I mean, partly it depends on where she would be. Um, uh, in Nova Scotia, we actually have quite a diversity of uh, whales that you can go see. So in the Bay of Fundy in July, anything from humpbacks, to North Atlantic, endangered North Atlantic right whales we get there in that time of year. Uh, lots of different dolphin species. You can also go off northern Cape Breton, so the island up the other tip, and uh, we have lots of humpbacks there as well, and also pilot whales. Okay, great. Um, Hal, this question is for you, this next question. Uh, you just took part in an event earlier today organized by WWF celebrating the 10th anniversary of Canada's first East Coast Marine Protected Area. WWF and, and many partners, including yourself, we all work together to establish this MPA, and it covers Sable Gully, which is about 200 kilometers off the coast of Nova Scotia and serves as a refuge for bottlenose whales. Can you talk about what this level of protection has done for these bottlenose whales over the past 10 years? Yeah, yeah. No, the, the gully is an extraordinary place. It, it's, a, it's a huge canyon, the largest one uh, off, off Eastern North America, and um, it's like the Grand Canyon underwater, and it's full of life, of corals, and strange fish, and, uh, and and the most emblematic species of the gully are these northern bottlenose whales that uh, Tonya and I have studied. And uh, so you go to the gully, and it's not always nice up there. It's often foggy and rough, and so on, but you wait, the whales will come to you. They're lovely whales. They're the most curious whales. They come up to the boat and they make rude sounds and they stick their noses out and they go round and round and then they go off into the fog. And um, they live in this in this canyon. Now, this seems like a lovely remote area. Two, as you said, 200 kilometers off the coast, um, way out there. But it's in the middle of a major industrial area. There are the gas fields, oil fields around Sable Island on one side. The whole area is a major fishing ground for all kinds of species. So when we first started um, studying the, the, the bottlenose of whales there in, in the late 80s, you saw fishing boats all the time that you could see through the fog. And uh, you could hear them through the hydrophones. So, uh, as Jamie says, for, for, for the, the the whales and, and the bottlenose whales are no exceptions. Um, sound is really important to them. And if we put sounds into the ocean, 
that's like giving a whole pod to the whales. It, 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 it takes out their ability to sense their environment, to sense each other, to sense their food, their dangers. Um, and uh, with the, the marine protected area, it, 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 as you said, it, it, it was established ten, 10 years ago, um, which was a, a huge achievement. And, and World Wildlife Fund actually was really spearheaded. They put, for seven or eight years, World Wildlife Fund kept at them, kept at them, kept at them, both the, the governments involved, the industry people involved, the average. Joe's in Nova Scotia and scientists like me and pushed and pushed and finally it happened. And it, it's a it's it's a great place. It's just wonderful to go out there and feel it is protected. And it really is protected. It, it, you know, nothing really happens in the main part of the gully, which is where bottomless whales hang out. Uh, not no oil, no fishing. Um, if we want to go and do research there we have to get permits and very carefully. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, yeah, it, it's but, great. I I think that the, the, you know because of this, the gully has grown a lot quieter. When we put the hydrophones down, we don't hear those fishing boats uh, and so on. So um, it's it's a better place for the whales. Fantastic. Thank thank you, Hal. And um, another question from the audience. Um, this one's from Emily. Uh, she wants to know what whale do we know the least about, and and this seems to be a common theme I'm hearing from you guys is that even though we've been studying this for you know many many years, decades, that there's still so much we don't know about. So uh, you know, Robert, if you want to take this question, I would say that probably the pelagic whales, the whales that live offshore, very far from the coast, are from far the least known. The, the beak whale. Some, some species have been known only from strandings only recently. Mm. So we just imagine we're in 2014 now, and there are still some of those 80 or so species of whales that have almost never been seen. Mm. Uh, last year, we found a sour bee beaked whale in the estuary, in the St. Lawrence estuary. It was the first sighting for us. I'd been there for 30 years, and we still see new things. So that's true, Hal was saying, that we don't know much about the whales, but I think that we don't know that much about the ocean. So it, it should give all our respect to that huge and immense uh, habitat in which the animals, uh, the whales live. And um, we should be a bit more cautious about what's going out, out there and who that's lives right. out there. We don't know them very well. That's right. And I mean, we do have uh, kids and, and young people watching this, and it's exciting to know that, uh, you know, as if they're ever interested in becoming a marine biologist, that there'll be lots of stuff for them to discover and, and study. So, uh, so you guys aren't hogging all of the, you know, the great research uh, that needs to be done. Um, so, so Robert, actually, this question um, is my question is for you. So we, let's talk about belugas. These guys live mainly in areas with Arctic sea ice, but um, and two thirds of the world population um, summers in Canadian waters. And of course, there are the belugas in the St. Lawrence River, which is what your special focus is on. So, can you tell us what's what's so special and unique about these belugas of the St. Lawrence? Uh, belugas of St. Lawrence are part of a, a group of animals that took refuge in the Atlantic at the last glaciation. But most of these animal, animals went back in the Arctic when the glacier retreated. And there is a small group of animals that decided to stay in the St. Lawrence estuary. They found there similar characteristic to northern waters. In the winter, it's covered with ice, and it was probably full uh, with, with food. Uh, they have a very diverse uh, diet, so they, they found all what they needed there. But now they live isolated from their closest neighbor. Uh, as many other species of whales around the, whale, the world, they've been overexploited until the mid-50s, mm -hmm. uh, only 60 years ago. And now uh, belugas have, we think they have survived through probably the most toxic period of the St. Lawrence. They survived through the very intense industrialization uh, period uh, of the Great Lakes in St. Lawrence. Um, belugas have been nicknamed the uh, the most contaminant uh, mammal on Earth recently. Mm. Uh, it was unfortunate, but some things are getting better. Uh, the Great Lakes have been investing huge effort to clean up their act. The same thing in the St. Lawrence. And over the 30 years that we've been studying these animals, we've seen some decline in the contaminants. 
But because we've been following those animals very closely, oh, and, and in other great news, we've seen a recent decline in the rate of cancers. The mm. were were uh, also a very sad re record of having the most cancer in wild animals. And, and this is on the way down. But while this is s slowly improving, Belugas, we discovered last year, uh, are in, in fact declining. The population is about 15% less than what it was 10 years That's ago. Right. And, and this is sad. We don't know exactly why again, but we suspect that large-scale change in their habitat. The winter is very different for, for these animals now. The ice cover is very much lighter. Uh, the water temperature have changed. Some stockfish on which they depended have been uh, going down. A new contaminant appeared in, in their environment. So there's about 900 beluga left in the St. Lawrence estuary, and we, they, they still need our help quite dramatically. That's right. And I think you, you alluded to this, but uh, the St. Lawrence River is one of the most commercially active shipping lanes in North America. So, the, you know, shipping traffic is a major source of uh, noise pollution, but also just uh, ship strikes. So how does this, you know, how, how much does this impact the belugas there? Uh, despite they have been exposed to rail traffic for a very long period of time, belugas are, are reacting to noise in different ways. Whenever a boat approaches them, they will change their vocal behavior. They will repeat their words or sounds more frequently. They will switch sometimes frequency to communicate, to keep contact between each other. They change, they upgrade their volume. So they have to adapt to that noisy habitat. But we have found that in, in several areas in the, within their summer grounds, there are quiet zones. And we mm -hmm. think these quiet zones may be important for female and young. And there's mm -hmm. actually a kind of a battle around how can we conserve these quiet zones? How important are these quiet zones? So even in very industrialized area like the St. Lawrence is, uh, finding those spots that are not pristine, but that remain some of the earlier quality of their natural habitat is very important and we did that we did map the quiet zone and now we have the information to to get after uh, the industries and work with them to keep these area from uh, more development and and they are pretty receptive whenever you sit with the industries with good sets of data uh, they are very open to listen and this is one of our role as scientists is to provide good science to make difficult choice that we have to, to make in order to, to keep these fascinating animals. And it's a real challenge and it's part of our job, daily job. We're out there spending time with whales. We're privileged. It's fascinating. But we have a very serious job is to get back in our lab with good data to provide answers to the, so many questions that are still unanswered and needed to, to better share the, the ocean and the St. Lawrence with these mm -hmm. whales. Mm -hmm. I really like what you said there, Robert, about, uh, you know, that's a key role for, for scientists. It's not just to collect the data and, and just set it aside and put it on the shelf, but it is hopefully informing good, sound decision-making at the uh, the government level and industry level. So, um, yeah, you're, no, I, I think that's absolutely important. Um, and uh, just one last audience question um, uh, from Elizabeth. She asks, how hard is it to tag whales in order to track their travels? I don't know if any of you guys have done that kind of work. Yeah. We, we've done that in the St. Lawrence with beluga whales with, with, yep. suction, pump, ah. with suction pump attached tags. We were kind of reluctant to use uh, those tags that you need to go through the skin to attach. Uh, it has been done on several species. It has learned, teach us very important things. But in small, isolated population like, like the beluga, we were quite reluctant to do that. But yeah. we used those suction cups that we buy at Canadian Tire, and they were <laughs> for short duration tracks. And with those tracking that records the, the dive and depth recordings, uh, we, we were able to, to map very precisely where the whales are, are, are spending most time. And this is the kind of information uh, we need to inform the industry about where they should or should not plan uh, industrialized uh, oil terminal, for example. So learning more about the detailed behavior of the animal through these uh, techniques when they are not too invasive is, is quite useful. 
That that's it's super important. But I have to ask about this: uh, the Canadian tire suction cups. Are these the ones that you buy from the you know the sh the shelves that you try to stick in your bathroom uh, shower? Like you just pull them off? No, the, 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 we we do buy them from the shelf, but to attach ski rack on on car roofs, they're a little bit more. Oh, robust. I see. And, okay. and they work very well. They worked on on fin whales. They work on humpback whales and on, on beluga whales pretty well. And so we have to get very close to the animal to attach that. We have we use a pole, and then smoothly we just up up the uh, the tag on the whale's back, and it, it stays on the animal for between eight and twenty four hours. So it's short duration tags, and it's giving us a lot of reward, lots of information. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That that I definitely did not know that. Um, well, Tanya and Jamie and Robert and Hal, I you know I hope you're having a good time. I hope the audience is enjoying this, and um, and I just want to um, thank all of you for sharing these stories and for all the questions that we got. And the, this question, uh, this conversation today has really highlighted how many serious threats um, are still facing Canada's whales today, and from you know, noise pollution to contaminants to, you know, potential oil spills and fishing gear entanglements and ship strikes and there's just there's just so much out there. Um, and of course, you know, what needs to be done to to protect these whales. And WWF is working to tackle uh, these threats and to ensure healthy oceans and waters for for our whales. And this work it needs your support to make that happen. And uh, you know, people can visit um, wwf.ca to learn more about our oceans work and to donate to this cause. And I just want to ask Tanya um, if you can talk a little bit about, and, and you did already, but um, you know, maybe the the MPA is a good example. But what makes um, WWF unique and effective in working in this area, and why it's so critical that uh, we continue to secure funding for this work? Um, well, I think, I mean, you heard from, all, you know, Hal and Robert and uh, Janie, too, that, I mean, you know, between all of them, they've been studying some of these species for 30 or more years, and, I mean, that's the same with many of the other populations of whales in Canada, um, but there's still so much to learn, and there's so much to know about the animals themselves, where they are, where they go, why they're there, um, and I think the other side of it you've been here, we've sort of given you an insight to as well, that there are still lots of threats which are basically threatening the very existence of some of these species. Um, you know, many people may not know that all of the ones we've talked about, the belugas, northern bottlenose, the orcas, um, you know, North Atlantic right whales, they're all listed under our federal law of uh, the Species at Risk Act. And, um, you know, they and, and many others, things like blue, our Canadian blue whales are listed as endangered. You know, the largest animal on the planet, and we have a piece of them here in Canada, and they're endangered. And I think the key thing is, you know, that means that they're, we're, we're really at risk of losing them forever. And I think that is a huge tragedy, um, not only for the important role they play in the ecosystem, but just even, I mean, for me, even personally, if, you know, to think that there may be some point that my you know, nieces and nephews may never see a blue whale or could never see a right whale, it, it just it, it is a little bit of a, you know, it hurts a lot to think from mm -hmm. that perspective. Um, so I think the thing is, is, you know, all of these issues that we're seeing in front of us, I mean, for us to be able to tackle them with our partners, for them to be able to do this research, you know, for us to be able to bring people together, for us to be able to work on boats with industry to try to figure out how to make a difference and how to make the world better for the whales and for us, you know, to do all of that, it's really crucial that we actually have uh, the, the support, um, you know, and, then, and the funding from people to do so and for, mm -hmm. for our partners to, be able to do this work. So it's, it's a critical piece of the, uh, of the pie as well. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you, Tanya. And it, it would be heartbreaking if, oh. for you know, our our nieces and cousins and future children and grandchildren not to to get to to um, see these whales or to know that they're there and to learn more about it. So, um, mm -hmm. thank you for sharing that, Tanya. And of course, thank you to all our um, scientists um, for for joining us today. And we have come to the end of our uh, broadcast. And um, I just want to thank you guys again for uh, sharing your important work with us and with the audience. And um, of course, you can learn more about our oceans work and whale work um, all on our website, www.ca. And uh, we hope you'll stay in touch with us. You can sign up for our monthly newsletter on our website, and you'll get the latest uh, and the greatest conservation stories and ways to uh, get involved and stay involved. 
And from all of us here at WWF, and um, I want to thank you for hanging out with us this evening. And I hope you'll join us for our next Hangout, which will be in September. And details for that uh, will be uh, available shortly. So stay tuned and have a great rest of your evening. Thanks again. And uh, signing off from WWF. Thank you.